Hello, welcome to series three of the BIBA webinars. This series of nine webinars covers the National Bee Improvement Programme. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please click the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. We will try to put as many of those as possible to the presenter at the end of the presentation. Please don't use the raise hand tab as it is too difficult to manage. Tonight's chair is Roger Patterson, and I'll hand you over to him now. Roger. Hopefully, Roger will be with yeah, us. Can you uh, can you say can you see me, Nick? I can't see you, Roger. Just uh, switch on your uh, video. I have. Anyway, you, you don't need to see me, do you? Um, no, can the people can, hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Okay, that's good enough then. Um, welcome, fellow beekeepers, or shall I say, progressive beekeepers. This is the first of nine webinars on the important topic of the National Bee Improvement Programme, NAPBIP for short. Um, the influence of importation of uh, bees on our own uh, stocks of bees has concerned many beekeepers for a long time. Um, on a personal note, um, I've been very frustrated at having good local bees crossed with exotic bees that may not particularly uh, suit our fickle climate. And um, I know up and down the country, it does cause uh, quite a lot of problems. However, that bit gives us the opportunity to do something, not individually, but together in your own locality, so that you're not fighting the tide on your own. If you can, um, please alert other beekeepers um, to work together. And probably the best way of doing that is through your local beekeeping association, of which is good coverage um, uh, throughout, um, uh, uh, throughout the country. <laughs> These webinars have been publicised widely. If you haven't heard from your BKA, uh, please ask them why not, because it may be that we don't have the correct details. Uh, perhaps uh, somebody's uh, changed position just recently. Um, we know there are a variety of people watching uh, tonight, so that shows us a wide uh, interest. Um, beekeepers of all experience levels, right from uh, absolute raw beginners, right up to very experienced beekeepers. We know there are bee farmers, beekeeping association officials, teachers, demonstrators, uh, apiary managers, and indeed scientists. So everybody is really in this uh, together. Um, the programme of webinars have been organised to give a logical sequence. Please listen to them all if you can, um, because um, some of the questions you may ask uh, at the end may be relevant to some of those that perhaps you might have missed. Uh, as Nick said, questioned at the end of each webinar, but uh, the last one will be a questions and answer uh, session only, because we want to know uh, what you want to know, and we'll try and answer where we can. Overall, there are five speakers um, with around about 200 years of beekeeping experience between them. Uh, so they're not inexperienced uh, beekeepers. They've, uh, they are all quite, um, uh, quite experienced. The first speaker is Joe Widdicombe uh, from Cornwall. Uh, he is a bee farmer with 150 colonies, so he himself has got... Um, uh, has got an interest in having good bees. So over to you, Joe. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm here. I'm just trying to get the uh, share screen, is it? One second. Ah, thank you. Is is that all right? Can everybody see and hear? Well, I, I won't know if you can't. But that looks I... good, Joe. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, well, greetings from Cornwall. And uh, it's strange for me because I can't see my audience. 
I assume some people are out there. Anyway, we'll crack on. Uh, first technical hitch, that's not changing. Slide's not changing. Why not? Press the right arrow, Joe. It has been working. Oh, God. Been working up to now, but it's not working now. I'll, um, I'll take this thing out. There we go. Ray, that's working. Right. Okay. Um, this week I'm going to outline the background to the National Bee Improvement Programme, how we came to think of the idea and, and how, what the general plan is. And next week I'll be going into much more detail of how it's going to work. So if you have detail, questions on the detail, it probably rest to hang on to next week, but anyway. Um, this is what I hope to cover tonight. The geographical area we're operating in, how the idea came about, why the National Bee Improvement Programme is needed, what it hopes to achieve, how the system will work, and how you can participate. And that's perhaps the most important thing. We're looking for maximum participation because that's how effective it will ultimately be. And, all that. and this is quite simple, the geographical area. That covers most of it. Um, Shetlands have mid missed off as they usually are, um, so apologies. And perhaps the Channel Islands as well. But basically it's the whole of Britain and Ireland and associated, associated islands, which is, um, where Bibber has always operated really. We want as many beekeepers from that area as possible to join us. Um, now, if we go back a little bit, um, we know we've been importing for about 160 years, um, well, maybe before that, but that was the first recorded one. Um, all, and everyone's been, been quite happy with that, we can say. In 1992, we discovered Varroa, uh, not far from me, and that caused quite a lot of devastation over the next decade or two, and is still pretty devastating today, really. Um, that led to a big decline in bees and beekeepers. And there was a bit of a panic at that point, especially, you know, BBK publicised the problems of declining beekeepers and and it was a real declining uh, pastime, if you like. So out of that panic came, um, in England and Wales anyway, the Healthy Bees Plan of 2009, uh, by DEFRA and the Welsh Assembly Government. They put together and they came up with this plan, how to, to reverse our fortunes, if you like. And the aim was to achieve a sustainable and healthy population of honeybees for pollination and honey production in England and Wales. Okay, I know we're talking about a bigger area in England and Wales, but this is just this particular uh, aspect. <clears throat> in that plan, the Welsh Agriculture Department have, have just, near the beginning, they've just mentioned their remit, uh, the Agriculture Department's remit, and part of it is protecting and improving the quality of stock, which I thought was pretty uh, interesting because that is, what really all beekeepers should be interested in. So, um, now the healthy bees plan, one of the things it identified risks to our bees and the bee population. And one of the things it, it, it pointed out was that the biosecurity risk of imported bees, they could bring in health issues and, um, since the plan was issued, imports have tripled, which means the, although they highlighted the risk, it didn't have any effect, basically. Um, DEFRA have became concerned, or are concerned, <coughs> about the risk of imports. And the fact they were rising so rapidly, really, and they held a series of meetings with representatives from the MBU and several beekeeping organisations. This is just in England, by the way. And they were sort of trying, they formed a group called the Queen Rearing, Wo Queen Rearing Working Group to see if we could rear more home, 
and read Queen's, um, implying that if we read more ourselves, we'd reduce the number of imports. And the meeting, meetings went along, and um, one other thing that the, the group did was carry out a survey of English beekeepers to find out their attitudes towards queen rearing and importing queens. Because nobody knew what beekeepers' attitudes were and why we were importing so many. And they got quite a good response, really. Uh, it was sent to all the uh, English beekeepers on, on Bee Base. And they received 4,800 replies. And um, there were some interesting questions, but one that perhaps stood out as far as Bibber was concerned was that um, many beekeepers would prefer home reared queens to imported ones. And this is the point 80% of respondents said they would support an improvement program based on the native bee, which is a stunning result. We didn't expect that. Um, Now, the, the queen rearing group went on to identify why, why are imported bees so popular? And there are good reasons for it. They're readily available, particularly early in the season. We can't produce them so, so early in the season in this country because of our climate. They're generally cheaper than um, queens are produced over here. And issues of quality were seen as a factor. Um, you can get some pretty well-reared queens and well-bred queens, if you like, because they, from particularly places like Denmark, where they have island mating stations and so on, and that's an important factor for some beekeepers. So there's a lot of competition, if you like. Give the perceived advantages of imported queens, we'd need a pretty good reason to make home-reared queens more desirable. And that was the, the question really. The group never, I felt, never really answered that. It's not just a matter of rearing more queens. The, the foreign ones might still be more, more attractive. And I, the conclusion I reached was that if we want to make more our homegrown queens more attractive, we need to have an improvement program based on our own stock of bees rather than on imports. And this would give the incentives we need to, for beekeepers to prefer home reared queens. So this idea of a national bee improvement sprung to mind and it's the Bibber committee have been working on it for quite a while now and it's attempt to refine our honeybee population with the aim of reducing imports and improving the quality of our bees two very important issues. It's, in, it's a proposal for a sustainable program of bee improvement. And the point is a bee improvement program using our own bees would not use any imported stock. Um, I'll explain why we're, why we're not in favor of that in a minute. But that, um, <coughs> it complicates the issue. Let's just leave it like that for a moment. But I must point out that Bibber is not proposing a ban on import. Um, this is what some people have interpreted as. There's plenty of beekeepers who still want to import bees. We're not proposing to ban them. We're just aiming to provide an alternative to give people, beekeepers that choice. So if they want to choose something else, they can. If they want to choose homegrown queens, they can. I'm trying to emphasise that point because one big beekeeping organisation said they couldn't support NatBIP because they didn't support, they, they couldn't support a ban on imports. But that is not what we're proposing. <clears throat> so why is bit, NatBIP in, is needed? I'm sorry to use the abbreviation, but it is a lot easier. And I think you all know what it means. Um, so are imported queens an advantage or are they a problem? Well, clearly many beekeepers think they're an advantage but there are problems with them. Uh, many businesses, bee businesses rely on them, but there are, I, we think there's problems. We think there's biosecurity risks. We're not the only ones who think that. DEFRA have recognized that as well. 
history tells us that. We know the Isle of Wight disease hit British bees badly in the early 20th century. No evidence, but almost certainly brought in on imported bees because the homegrown bees suffered most badly. They never seen the disease before. Varroa, again, almost certainly brought in on imported bees, even though we had a ban at that time. And recently there's been questions about chronic bee paralysis virus, which is raising its head in quite a big way, but I'm not gonna, you know, the jury's still out, should we say, on that one. Um, imports have the effect of continuous hybridization of subspecies. Some people think that's a good thing because it increases genetic diversity. The problem with hybrids is you cannot select and improve. The offspring are too variable and it mucks up improvement programs. Um, and it's not just Bibber saying that, it's bee breeders around the world say the same thing. Um, they say, many beekeepers say stick to a, a strain or a subspecies of bee. Um, the Smart Bees program said maladapted genes do not help and they were quite concerned from a conservation point of view that all these different subspecies should be preserved. Now that's fine but we're not just about preserving a, a type of bee, we're also about having a bee that's, that has the qualities that we want. So they already said difficult to select and improve from a hybridized population. Imports can produce short-term improvement in quality, there's no doubt about that, but quality only maintained with further imports. One of the reasons people reach out for imports is because their own bees, the temper of them goes, goes off. They find themselves with aggressive bees. They can't wait to requeen with something more docile. And we're, it seems to me we're setting up a vicious circle with this importing, quality goes off, import another one to bring the quality back. Um, the question of heterosis or hybrid vigor is important because many people swear by it. Um, again, is it an advantage or a problem? It's widely used in agriculture and plant, plant and animal breeding. Successfully, it has to be said. Um, and Brother Adam developed its use in honeybees with the buckfast bee. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that said, popularity ever since. And it's got qualities, you know, the hybrid vigor counts for a lot. The big problem for, as far as I see it, is that unlike other animals and plants, control of mating bees is much, of the mating of bees is much more difficult. We can keep repeating the hybrid vigor in animals and plants very easily. We just take a pure strain and pure strain cross them and you've got that hybrid vigor. In bees with multiple matings of the queen, multiple drones, we end up with a, a real hybridized um, mess, I would I call it. The mating system of bees is good at preventing inbreeding, but offspring of hybrid bees quickly degenerate into a random hybridized mix of subspecies. Select and improving from mixed stock is difficult because the bees do not breed true. And this is why we all struggle for, to get a quality of bee in this country. And we, we haven't really been able to get to grips with it. And this improvement program is designed to finally find a solution and get to grips with that problem. As I already said, bee breeders recommend breeding within a subspecies or strain. And this is a quote from just one of them. This is the most recent quote from this book that was issued in English this year. He said, selection is only possible within, in the framework of a well-defined population. For example, within a given race or a fairly large local population that will be disrupted as little as possible by the introduction of foreign bees. And I agree with that statement. 
you find it very difficult to get uh, regular breeding from a hybrid popula hybridized population. I mean, Mendel pointed that out when he first started working on the laws of hereditary. Must be uh, 150 years ago, probably. Um, details of how to reduce hybridization and work within a strain next time. We're going to go into that in more depth. How we can get over that problem. So why is that bit needed? Let's look at the quality of our bees. What have we achieved in 160 years of import? Some people are happy. Um, they import regularly and they like what they get. But for the rest of us, we got a rather variable mix. Imports produce short term improvement in quality, but the quality can only be maintained with further imports. System of sustainable improve, improvement has not been achieved. And that's what this program is designed to answer. Can we get a sustainable improvement in our bees? So it's trying to try, time to try a different approach that can deliver a sustainable improvement in our bee population. And we believe this could work. Um, let's look at bee breeding and bee improvement a moment. Bee breeding, when you have complete control over the two parents, so it's usually achieved through instrumental insemination or isolated mate apiaries. And by that method, good some good results have been produced. What happens when you introduce them into our, our bees? We can enjoy the results for a little while, but in succeeding generations, we lose the qualities. It just gets lost in the general population. There's no system in place to maintain the quality. If we can establish the system of bee improvement in the general bee population, bee breeders producing compatible stock could add to the quality in a sustainable way. So they, we wouldn't lose their, what, their good work. It wouldn't be lost in our system. We wouldn't be lost to hybridization, basically. So can we achieve this? Can it? Good intentions are all very well, but the system must work. It needs to be self-supporting, that, that means vi financially viable, and be able to maintain indefinitely, maintain indefinitely. So it's a, a sustainable system. It should be able to maintain or improve quality over successive generations. Maintain genetic diversity, within a, but within a useful framework. And that is crucial. We all want a diverse genetics within our bees. <clears throat> the framework means within the same type of bee because then they can still breed true. And the system encourage, we can encourage local adaptation. It's a population that's suited to and thrives in its environment. Aims to produce hardy, docile and productive bees. System should be flexible enough to produce the best bee in a changing world. So if environmental or climatic conditions change, <clears throat> the bees can still be carried on. We can still be selecting the bees to suit the changing conditions. So how are we going to answer all those points? How are we going to fulfill all those points? And I don't think anyone can claim we've managed it so far with all our imports. That hasn't been the answer. It's temporary relief only. Beekeeping is a partnership between the beekeeper and the bee. We all know that. In a sustainable system, both must benefit. The program is based on our available local stock, which you might think, well, that's a bad place to start because there, it's not that brilliant. It's the only place to get a sustainable system going. And we build the system on natural and artificial selection. <clears throat> that means the natural selection is what nature survive, gets to survive. Artificial selection is what the beekeeper chooses. And you come back, combine those two things and you end up with the best possible answer. 
it is acceptable stock to be bought in from other areas, but in the scheme, but it must be compatible. Participants will avoid using imported stock or the offspring of recently imported stock. It just doesn't mix, causes that hybridization and breakdown of the system. So, brief outline of how the program will work. Next week, um, I'll go into a lot more detail, but this is, it's gonna be simple and simple to, for beekeepers to use. We want all beekeepers to join this program, you know, whatever their skills and level of beekeeping. Beekeepers to keep a record of every colonist's performance. Uh, we will be issuing record cards, but you can use your own design or you may already have a group that's using its own design and so on. It's not mandatory to use our record card, but it is one that, that will be available and simple to use. Um, the aim of the record keeping is to allow the selection of breeder queens. That's the queens that will produce the next generation. I haven't really said what was on the record card, but it'd be things like docility of the bees, um, whether, they, whether they swarm or not, um, and various things, but I'll go into a lot more detail with that next week. Um, the key to the system is the breeder queens. Some people say the key to the system of bee improvement is the drones. But the breeder queens is the drones, but through the breeder queens, the great breeder queens produce the daughters, and we can produce as many daughters as we like. And the daughters will produce the good drones to mate with the next generation of, of new queens. And it's by selecting these breeder queens repeatedly that we can keep a good supply of good drones and get, gradually get better and better matings. And that will help to enhance that by um, concentrating in smaller areas in what I call mating zones or mating areas where we can focus on getting uh, the bees we want and not being influenced by outside bees. Um, again we'll go into that in more detail next week but it, it's been shown to be able to work. Okay. So what are the advantages selected from what we've got? Bear in mind it is in many areas a bit of a mishmash. Some areas have got more consistent bees than others. Um, we hope to reduce the biosecurity risks immediately because we'll be reducing importation. Um, we'll avoid continual introduction of untested gene, new untested genes in here. When we bring in a queen from abroad, those genes haven't been tested in our conditions. So why we, you know, we do that and then we have to see if it's any good or not. And those genes are getting left, let loose in our environment and it can have a knock on effect for quite a long time to come. <clears throat> By not importing bees, we'll gradually reduce the hybridization in our population as natural and artificial selection take shape and will shape the population. Bees start to be true, results in more rapid progress. That's what we're aiming for, bees that breed true. So the offspring are quite similar to the parents. There'll still be variation, obviously, and that's how you get a better bee. Because in that offspring, you've got a lot of variation. You select the best ones again to go forward for the next generation and on it goes. By selecting bees that do well in our conditions, we develop a more locally adapted population. Now, every time we, in, uh, uh, we get the influence of imported bees into our area, we lose that local adaptation. <clears throat> and there's enough genetic diversity in our bee population to select any qualities that we want. So we don't need to look anywhere else, we just need to refine what we've got. System of open mating maintains genetic diversity. And we can use that to our advantage. As long as we can refine, get them into a strain, it all works well. Now, it'll only work if people participate. 
and that's what we're looking for beekeepers to come forward and say yes i'd like to join that we're seeking the wide, widest possible support and I'll, I'll give you a few examples in a minute but small scale beekeepers can still select their bees they can increase their influence by working in groups and in a, maybe an improvement group set up specifically to improve people's like interest or there might be a local association uh, large-scale beekeepers some ways it can be easier for them because they already have a plenty of bees they can have greater influence they can dominate an area and there will be opportunities for them to supply other beekeepers with stock so it's quite a good incentive for them to do that and supporters of the scheme perhaps they feel oh, i haven't got time for taking a very active part in, in this but they can support the scheme just purely by not committing to use imported bees for a start and they might be able to take advantage by um, purchasing queens from the scheme at some point a few examples of participation um, small scale beekeepers how could they take part they can refrain refrain from using imported bees and keep records of their colonies performance and they can from those records they're able to select which colonies to make increase from and which to replace and it's a simple procedure and I know it's only on a small scale so they're not going to have much influence in their area but it's a start and it's where it's very welcome if they want to take it a bit further they can join other beekeepers in forming a group um, so then the small scale beekeepers can get greater influence and start affecting an area they can establish their local strain in an area and then feed out from that supply local beekeepers with queens so the strain is getting more widespread and then larger scale beekeepers and bee farmers i mean they're particularly welcome to join the program um, they're able to exert more influence in an area greater number of stocks and much more choice to select breeder queens they'll have business opportunities to supply home reared queens and nukes i mean some bee farmers rely on or imported queens as a big part of their business there will equally be business opportunities in this scheme and local benefit local beekeepers will benefit from any be big scale beekeepers in their area in the scheme now one thing we're proposing to do is <clears throat> have a guidebook issue a guidebook to help everybody find their way understand what they should be doing how they can do it and um, we're all in different circumstances and starting positions um, but NAPBIP, NAPBIP is available to all beekeepers whatever their circumstances so we're um, reaching out to everybody whatever bees they've got at the moment and we're not going to dictate methods that must be used we're going to make suggestions in the guidebook and help for people who want to know how, what they can do and so on. Um, the guidebook will most likely be online and you can just approach it and download the relevant sections that you need, for example. Um, and all, well, before I give the examples, we'll be able to update this guidebook frequently. It can be added to, updated, modified as required in the light of participants experiences and needs so it'll include things like record keeping there'll be a record card that you can download and use uh, how to make increase so you can produce new colonies for your queen um, queen rearing techniques making nukes mini nukes running improvement groups and so on whatever is needed to for the, to make this program a success Now, just to summarise the aims of the programme, all 
beekeepers can benefit from a sustainable system of improvement. The aim is to provide an alternative to imports, thus reducing biosecurity risks and reducing hybridization. The improvement will be based on current stock and will combine natural and artificial selection to develop a better bee. One ongoing rule or principle, and you know, we're never going to get everybody to agree. We understand that because we are beekeepers and we've all got different opinions. But we're hoping to reach out to a lot of beekeepers, a majority of beekeepers. Uh, but we have we have have had to make one rule because it does affect the way the program goes. The pro improvement program will not use imported bees or the offspring of recently imported bees. We're trying to develop from our own stock. And the only way to do that is through the system of natural and artificial selection with no, without keep adding exotic genes. So how can you support or take part in that bit? Now, uh, on the right, top right, that's the provisional logo for, for the program. It, it hasn't, it's just a draft. <clears throat> you could join Bibber and uh, support the program in that way uh, for 20 pound per year by direct debit, or the other way to do it is to sign up as a supporter of that BIP and that's free of charge. Either whichever way you do, you'll be kept fully informed of progress and information will be given to you and you'll be provided with access to the, the guidebook and so on. So we recommend you do one of those two things. And if you go to that, that's your link to the, the page. And I think a uh, possible logo, a possible, um, what's the word, catchphrase for it, protecting and improving the quality of our honeybees. That's what the program's all about. And that's the end of my um, presentation. It's a bit shorter than perhaps I anticipated by a few minutes, but there's time for a few questions and answers. And it's good not to go on too long because we're all looking at a computer screen. And I think the shorter the better, really. Thank you. Right, uh, thanks very much, uh, Joe. Um, that wasn't easy putting all that lot across because there's an awful lot to it and there's a lot more um, uh, to be thought about too. Um, we got quite a lot of questions come in. Uh, I've had a quick scan through them. Um, and. Um, uh, they're quite diverse. Uh, some of them are a little bit on the political side, uh, but I think most of them are, are fairly sensible um, uh, uh, questions. Um, <coughs> uh, what I won't do is identify the uh, questioner because I think that's, uh, that's un unfair and unreasonable. Um, let's pick on the first one. Fairly simple then. Uh, whilst imports are uncontrolled, is it not impossible to achieve the objectives of NatBIP? It, it certainly makes it more difficult, but we're hoping to reduce imports as a first step by people signing up to this program. And then we're hoping to dominate in small areas, we'll <coughs> dominate with our bees in small areas. So that is what I've tried to do in the area around me. I've tried to uh, exclude the influence of imported bees. And we've got to do that process in many different areas around the four countries. And I forgot to mention, to change the subject slightly, I, think, I don't think it's impossible is the answer to the question. I think we can do it, but we've got to focus on small areas at a time. But what I forgot to mention in my talk was, we've called it the National Bee Improvement Programme. But of course, we're talking about f at least four nations, not to mention the Cornish, um, but, uh, so please don't take that as an insult that we've just called it a national program. Anyway, carry on. Right, Roger. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this obviously will take time, Joe, and um, it's going to take a little bit of time perhaps convincing people that, um, uh, that there is a little bit of alternative to um, what there is at the moment. Um, 
Uh, well, next one here. Thanks, Joe. Much needed ideas to help us get healthy, local, productive bees, especially for small hobby beekeepers. Um, now, um, that's really just a statement, but um, really we, what, what we're trying to do surely is affect all beekeepers, not just uh, hobby beekeepers or commercial beekeepers, uh, uh, trying, to get, trying to satisfy everybody. Well, we are. That's true. And it's, it is difficult because most of us are small scale beekeepers and we are a bit at the mercy of who our neighbours are and so on. And um, <clears throat> I did stress the importance of large scale beekeepers in the scheme. And there, believe you me, there are pl plenty of them who are sympathetic to these ideas. And I think they will have a big impact and will help us help the smaller scale ones as well. But smaller scale ones have got to club together, workers groups, and it is not impossible. And I think with enough publicity, um, progress can be made. I agree it will take time, but we've got to be positive about it and show that what can be done. Because we've seen examples that people have made progress. Yes, it's extra difficult because they keep being influenced by imported bees. But if we can get the numbers of imports down, progress will be that much faster. Okay, a uh, simple one. Have you the support of DEFRA and BBKA? Good question. Simple answer is no, not yet. Um, we, we've had to go it alone because everybody else said no thank you. Um, it's a sad state of affairs, um, but to coin that, phrase at the bottom of my last slide but i can't read it because i've got something in the way but protecting and improve or something protecting an improvement of our honeybees or something it says i mean surely every beekeeping organization should have that at their the heart of their doing even the bee farmers i think should be more sympathetic uh, because many of their members are sympathetic to this it doesn't and I've, as i said we no intention of seeking a ban on imports so those who want to go down that road can still go down that road, but we want to provide an alternative system. And I think uh, there'll be enough people to support that, mm -hmm. to make it a viable proposition. I think I'd better point out, Joe, that um, with another eight uh, webinars to come, a lot of these questions may well be answered by other people or certainly uh, um, uh, approached by other people. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is quite an interesting one, which we've actually discussed in the last few weeks. Do you have a definition of import? Is it Cornwall to, is Cornwall to Edinburgh okay? What about ERA to UK? Yeah, really good question. And uh, it needs answering. Um, I think that's a, the point about imports and exotic imports is the, the difference in subspecies, I think. Um, and I, our bees are hybridised, we, we admit, in this country mostly. Um, so um, what we don't want to do is keep hybridising. So we have discussed the point and we, we don't want to keep importing from Europe and the rest of the world because we feel that is adding to our, our hybridisation. But we're happy to uh, move bees around Ireland and Britain if they're the same, basically the same type of bee. Um, but on the whole, we favor, yeah, everybody's gonna have their own view on this, but on the whole, I favor keeping bees local and regional. Mm. And I think that's better. Um, and my bees in corn perhaps would not perform very well in Scotland. But uh, there, are, there is a case for uh, bring in, say, bring in bees in from Ireland to somewhere because they might feel they've got absolutely nothing of native. Uh, I'm getting into deep water here. Sorry, you're going to have to help me out, Roger. But we uh, we have said it's okay to to import within this area that we represent. I think in discussions, Joe, we generally felt that um, all of the UK, Ireland, Channel Islands, Isle of Man, all the um, surrounding islands um, was okay. The problem with importation from elsewhere is the biosecurity um, uh, issue, which has just been um, um, 
Yeah, that's certainly uh, report, one issue. reported scientifically. That's um, one issue. Yeah, okay. But this is quite an interesting one. How can you be sure your starting point hasn't already been influenced by imports? I think our starting position has been very much influenced by imports. Most of us have got very uh, bees of numerous subspecies. <clears throat> Certainly when I started, my bees were very uh, influenced by imports. Um, I have been able to refine them. Um, and that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with any other subspecies, but I've tended to work with what I consider to be the dominant subspecies in our conditions. And uh, the, what I've got now, if you put it under DNA analysis, you'd probably say, still say, oh, that's not a pure something or other. That's still a mixture of bees, but at least they're more uniform and I think they breed true. And that's, the, that's what we're seeking, bees that breed true. So however you do that is up to you. Um, we, um, within Bibble, we've got our views of the easiest way to do that. Um, but we've got to broaden this out to include beekeepers of all points of view. And if they're selecting, if, if they're working with the, within the parameters of natural and artificial selection, they'll find that the bees will homogenize to some extent. And I think that will be to their advantage. Uh, this next one, you, you've sort of covered in a, in a roundabout way, but probably not expanded on it perhaps as much as um, uh, you could have done. How can we decide what qualities are desirable when different beekeepers have different priorities. Some may want quiet strains, other maximum honey production, etc. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's one I've thought about a lot. And um, <clears throat> I've discussed it with beekeepers from time to time. And I used to say, oh, we all want something different. But actually, I was surprising how similar most of us <coughs> want to have the same requirements. And most of us want a docile bee. Uh, most of us want a productive bee. Some people say they don't care about production, um, but they do care about the environment. The, as far as I'm concerned, if bees are pollinating plants, that is part of their production. But anyway, honey production. Um, but this is why we say it's up to the individual and up to the groups to sort it out for themselves. Um, in my particular selection process so I do um, docility, low swarming, health and brood pattern and, um, and honey production but and I also do I try to select for a, a uniformly a uniform strain but anyway um, different areas will have similar things to that but they might vary it slightly and they're perfectly entitled to vary it slightly. They can have discuss amongst themselves which qualities they'd like to go for. Someone else might have um, Varroa tolerance top of their list and they might that might be a huge thing for a group for example and there won't be anything wrong with that. They're entitled to do whichever whatever they want. So we're not dictating the qualities they go for. Yes the record card that we put up available will have certain qualities on it but you're welcome to adapt it or design your own record card you do what you like and i think we have to recognize that beekeepers need to have that choice i think i would argue that um just because you've got um uh bad tempered bees doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a lot more honey because uh, there is the old view that bad tempered bees collect more honey um, I'm afraid that's not that's that's not my experience because I've I've seen some very docile colonies produce a, a lot of honey as well. Um, uh, uh, there's a couple of interesting comments here, and they are really comments, Joe. So perhaps you might not want to make a, uh, make a, <laughs> make an issue of it. One one said, um, I'm sure BBKA can be convinced, which is uh, uh, which is interesting. Um, but thinking about it seriously, all those that are in the BBKA are part of the BBKA. The BBKA isn't just the executive committee, it's, no. it's everybody. This is Wherever true. It's in the BBKA. I, I will comment because I, I'm sure <laughs> the beekeeping organisations that have sort of sat on the fence or said, no, it's not for us. 
uh, will change their minds. And, uh, and as you say, their members will vote with their feet. And uh, it isn't up to the executive ultimately, it will be up to the members what they want to do. So yeah, I think they will come round. Um, this is another slightly political one, um, and I'm not sure it's correct anyway, but uh, I will ask it. Is it going to be possible to get bee farms to follow NAPIC precepts, uh, bearing in mind how much more productive imported queens are? Kicking off earlier in the year and maximizing honey crop. Uh, well, I think there's, you, you could argue yeah, about something. I think that's a good, a good question, and I think it's a fair comment. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, a lot of bee farmers will stick with what they know because they're getting good returns. Um, but I, I hope that in time, this will prove itself, this program will prove itself with productive bees. And I certainly select the ones that kick off well in the spring as one of my breeders. And I don't like ones that take half a season to get going and so on. I'm the same as any other bee farm. I like things, I like them to be productive. I'm not saying my bees are more productive than others or even as productive as some of these imports at the moment, but I feel I'm, a, I'm making progress and going in the right direction. Um, there's a simple one here. What does breed true mean, which I guess a lot of people might not know. Very good question. Yep. If you, um, if you, uh, you've got a couple of mongrel dogs, uh, they've got all sorts of breeds in them and you cross them you don't know what the puppies are going to look like they're all going to be different shapes and sizes and colors if you've got two pedigree dogs uh, two springer spaniels you cross them you know the puppies are all going to be like springer spaniels they will vary you can pick out the ones you like best but they're all roughly the same type if we're crossing hybridized bees um, the offspring are very different and it's very hard to get, make any sense of it in terms of selection and uh, you can pick out the best uh, and pick out the best ones to breed from and, uh, and you breed from them but because they're so hybridized and that you've got a lucky fluke there that's with hybrid vigor it's producing tons of honey and you breed from it and the offspring are all different shapes <laughs> shapes and sizes again and, and not they're all not producing tons of honey and i think we get more consistency when they breed true does that make sense okay joe i think so um they're coming in thick and fast now <laughs> right. um and uh, uh they're actually all quite good um and this is one which might concern some people how will we minimize the risk of bee disease being passed around by members of the scheme? Um, now that's a pretty, pretty sort of, uh, not an obvious question to ask, but it's, um, it's, it's really quite relevant. Um, really important one. And uh, yeah. I, you can't stress the importance enough really. Um, obviously the health of the colony is crucial. And certainly when it comes to bee breeding, uh, or, Rearing, queen rearing, I should say, and so on. You're mixing colonies, you're moving things around, you're making nukes. It's a perfect conditions for spreading disease if you're not careful. So, you know, you, it just re requires, the first requirement really is you're breeding from healthy stock and you have to be very aware of that. Right, okay. Um. Should we not be looking at bees a part of the, or I think there should be as a part of the environment as opposed to a pet? Uh, I would not agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I have access to over 2,000 acres of woodland with no imported bees within three miles. These are survivor bees, untreated living in trees. 24 nests colonies provides a suitable population. Are there more of these areas? Have they been identified? There may well be more areas, but <clears throat> I don't think they have been identified. Uh, they're very interesting from lots of points of view. Um, but the other, th and the, you know, they're fascinating uh, from a resource point of view and a conservation point of view. 
But uh, we also have to remember that uh, the importance of bees in our food production and in our pollination particularly. And we cannot just rely on wild bee colonies. It's great if we've got them, but the beekeeper does play an important role in this day and age. And without the beekeeper, we would be uh, pretty up the creek as far as food production goes. So I agree, wild colonies are great and important, uh, but beekeepers have a role as well. This next one, Joe, I'm going to ask it. There's several points uh, involved, and it's, it's almost a lecture in its, in its own, but I'll, I'll, I will ask it because there's uh, several relevant points here. <coughs> I support the move to stopping importing bees. There is a fundamental problem with the approach being proposed in that natural selection and artificial selection will be opposed to one another. The choice has to be one or the other. Both cannot be achieved. For example, quiet strains, low swarming or strains that produce maximum honey do not necessarily generate bees that have the capacity to endure. The focus seems to be on honey production, which means that you want to override natural selection. Is this true? Uh, it's a complicated question. Um, it, it, it is rather, but I think there's a lot of points in there. It's a good point. Which, which um, are quite, quite relevant. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would argue that the system I use, I, I don't bring in bees into my area. We don't bring any bees in. And we use what we've got. We've been doing that for a long time. They are the product of natural selection. It's what has survived in the area. If they don't survive, they've lost to the system. Uh, I add to that system. So when I come along in the spring, <coughs> survived, some have died. I've got the natural survivors. They've survived natural selection. Then I come along as a beekeeper and I say, I want to see this and this qualities in my bees. So then I select uh, this uh, docile one that is, I know it's productive last year and so on. I can use that as my breeder queen. So I'm applying my, my needs and my wants uh, to the, I think the two can be compatible. And uh, I don't see any reason why my, <coughs> my needs are gonna be, make the bee under any more risk of dying than anything else. So I think they do work. And I, I do stress the importance of the beekeeper. And a lot of people these days think the bee is everything but the beekeeper puts lots of time and effort into his beekeeping, his or her beekeeping. He needs a reward as well as, every, as well as everything else. Both benefit, and that's the system that I recommend, that the beekeeper benefits, the bee benefits, the environment benefits, our food production benefits. I know this is your uh, lecture, Joe, but if you don't mind, I'll, I'll nip in here a little bit here because I'm actually just working on this very point uh, for one of mine towards the end. Um, I think the way to look at it is see how bees survive and then try and copy them because they are survivors. They're making sure they're productive. They're making sure they're healthy. Um, uh, they're making sure they're hardy. And um, uh, I believe personally they're doing it themselves. I don't see too much difference between natural selection and artificial selection if you actually understand what the bees are trying to do. So that's my pennyworth. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, the beekeeper has slightly different demands to the bee in that the bee doesn't care if it's aggressive or docile in a way. It will do what makes it survive. Uh, the beekeeper likes a docile bee because it's easier to work with. So we might have slightly different demands, but I, I believe the two can work together. Yep, uh, so do I, yeah. Um, right. Um, having imported in the past, how long before I can get involved in that bit? <laughs> you can get involved right away. And I, I would well, we would welcome anyone who wants to get involved right away. The only commitment is that you don't, don't continue to import. So you can start with what you've got. This is the whole point. We're starting with whatever stock we've got. It's 
it's going to be I mean, I don't know if it's the pro no, I'll, I'll leave it to next week, but I'll talk a bit more next week about selecting with it a strain and so on. I don't think it's the time to do it now. But we welcome people right away to join the project. Um, there are two uh, questions identical from different people. Will you send out the link, please? Quite frankly, I don't know um, what that is. Uh, did you put up a link, Joe? Yeah. Um, um, it's right. Why, uh, well, 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 wait just a minute. Um, we'll show it at the end. These are going to be recorded, uh, so anyone can pick them up from uh, the recording, can't they? Yeah. And we perhaps can, perhaps we can show the slide. Uh, I can try and show the slide now. Can you see the slide? The last slide up now. I don't know what's showing. Okay. We'll have to put the link up you somehow. You need to share your screen again, Joe. Okay, share screen. Okay, is that coming through? Yeah, that's showing up. Okay, can we can we talk through that then? Um, a question which probably you you can't answer, Joe, but I'm I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm sure other people are, it's, it's on the uh, on their tongues. Why is it not possible for DEFRA to ban imports? Um, that's not a question for me. Really. <laughs> that's a question for DEFRA, but. Um, I don't know. They probably could if they wanted at this stage. Well, um, the, the, the excuse used to be that we're part of the EU. Yeah. Um, but somebody, somebody said that we, we, we've dumped that lot now. They wouldn't want to ban imports, I don't think, because they use them themselves <laughs> at um, the NBU. I would like to comment on that. I don't know. <laughs> um, next one, we're getting back to Buckfast. There's quite a lot of Buckfast questions, really. Uh, the Buckfast bee is so ubiquitous that surely it will be difficult to keep the genetics stable in hobby beekeepers across the southwest. Uh, well, I think actually it's a problem elsewhere because... Good um, point. Yeah, I, um, I looked all day at about 25 colonies um, a couple of months ago and they were virtually all Buckfast-ish. So... Um, what's your view on that, Joe? It's a really good point, and it is difficult. Um, but I, th I say to people, I mean, I know what it's like, because just across the water from me, in South Devon, it's, it seems to be all buckfast. But um, uh, what can they do? They can select the best bees they've got and see how the strain develops. Stop importing any bees. Well, they won't, because people... But, you know... Um, you can only work with what you've got, really. And, uh, and that's the point about this programme, is people have got to make the most of what they've got. And that was a slogan for um, a Bibber meeting, a Bibber conference in 1996, making the most of what you've got, which I really related to. And I thought it was a brilliant starting point. And that's the place to start. How it develops, we think it will develop in the right direction. That's why we're having faith, having the faith to go along with this. But um, you can, you've got to do what what's suitable for your area, really. I think probably, Joe, what will happen is that um, any um, undesirable um, uh, genes, uh, nature will take out sooner or later. So I, I think we'll that's probably get back to a decent, um, well, once I say a decent bee, but something that's, that's more suitable. Um, yeah, I've, that's got, I've got to raise the issue on Buckfast because people keep talking about Buckfast bees, not realising that they are incredibly variable. A lot of beekeepers seem to think they, they, they're all exactly the same, uh, but in fact they're not. Um, there's no definition as I know of for Buckfast uh, bees. Uh, so you'll probably get a Danish Buckfast, it's different than a German, it's different than a Greek, different than a Canadian, uh, different than English or Irish. Um, and uh, I think the genetics is, is so different that they're all basically seem to be mongrels from what I can understand. I think what this program is doing is appealing to people to start improving our own bees 
and forget about imports and we can get something better eventually that's more suited to us and that's what what i'd like and i think people will relate to that and join in with us there are several questions about instrumental insemination artificial artificial insemination call it what you like um but this one i think covers some of the points that the others have uh, uh, have raised keeping pure stocks exclamation mark how can a normal beekeeper with several hives ensure the purity of your stock without artificial insemination? We cannot ensure matings with our own stock drones. So it's impossible, is it not? As we just cannot afford the insemination equipment, plus we don't have the ability even if we had the equipment. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the answer to that is it's very difficult if you're a small scale beekeeper but if you can get together with other like-minded beekeepers, you can achieve something in a group. And it might be that you have to work in a certain area in your region where you know you can uh, dominate with the, the members of the group's bees and then they can get to decent matings and then they, they can use it as a mating apiary and then take the bees back to their own apiaries after that. But people can achieve things in groups that they can't achieve singly, individually. Um, okay. Um, again, I'll, I'll jump in just a little bit. There, there are a lot of people around the country who are actually improving their bees uh, locally uh, simply by um, reducing the imports and then breeding from the best of, 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 of what's left. And it's surprising what has actually been achieved. Yeah, and, that's uh, exactly this is, what we're after. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will get back to, um, yeah, when deciding the quality of the best bee, is there a trade-off? For instance, docile is good for the beekeeper, but can they be robbed more easily? Voracious uh, bees can produce more honey, but can use up winter stores quicker. Is there going to be a discussion, agreement, on what makes the best bee? Yeah, it's up to the individual to some extent. If you're working as a group, it's up to the group to decide what is their main priority. And when I started, um, my main priority was some bees that weren't too aggressive because that takes all the pleasure out of it. And I started with that. And that's quite a simple one to, to achieve, actually. And then you start thinking, well, hang on a minute. I'm putting all this time and effort in. I want them to produce some honey. So gradually we want these productive bees and so on. And it's up to you to balance out your priorities and we can't dictate that every beekeeper is going to have a different idea of what his priority is but if you work it as a group you have to reach an agreement is there any prospect of setting up a native bee breeding program on one of our islands for example lundy island <clears throat> um well um, <clears throat> isolated mating apiaries are useful but they're and they're useful for bee breeding and getting really good uh, results from bee breeding but this is setting the basics the the base if you like we're, we're trying to improve the trouble is when you bring in a highly bred queen you've only got to go one generation and you've more or less lost it um, this is the snag with this this is how we've really been running up to now. And I think we've got to get something more basic. We've got to start improving what we've got just in their natural environment, really. I, I'm not against uh, isolating mating apiaries. I think they can be very useful and they can work, especially if we can get them to work with this system as well. That we could really achieve something. But we, we can't ignore the basic bee improvement system. If the purpose was conservation, uh, then yes, it, it, it could easily be done. But we do need quite a lot of queens um, that are probably beyond uh, an island producing them. But there are certain islands where they are effectively isolated mating stations uh, anyway. Um, so, you know, that, that's still been achieved. Um, this is an interesting one. Will the scheme be supported by an identifiable marketing support? For example, the red tractor scheme used in animal husbandry and meat retail. Will the program have a similar 
means of identifying partaking beekeepers so we can easily recognise each other? Uh, I think that'd be a really good idea. I'd like to see something like that. It's all part of the marketing of the scheme and I think it could help us go a long way. But at the moment it's in the elementary stages <clears throat> and people with good ideas like that can come forward and help by all means. And um, it's, you know, I don't know who'll be running the scheme in the future and all good ideas are welcome, basically. Uh, I hope the scheme will just evolve as it goes along. And uh, it's, starting, it's starting now in a very small way and it's going to just keep evolving and growing. So anything that helps towards that is good. Uh, just a comment. Instead of the bee improvement program, I suggest bee recovery program. <laughs> uh, which is okay if you're talking about um, uh, conservation, isn't it? Um, but it's certainly worth, with no reason why there can't be two going. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand that. <laughs> um, well, well re recovery is, I assume, <laughs> bringing back what we used to have. Right. Rather than improving what we've actually got. Okay. Um, well, I think the point about this scheme and the system is that the bee will carry... Some people... We're always being accused of wanting to put the clocks back to 1850. And that's not what it's about at all. It's about developing the bee so it evolves with environmental conditions, with climatic conditions, with agricultural conditions. It's just constantly evolving uh, as is necessary. And that's how I like to see it go. But if people wanted to, um, uh, uh, to select that much further, there's no reason why they, they can't. No. Um, thanks, Joe. Really interesting points put forward. How can we get the associations involved? I'm assuming we're talking about beekeeping associations. We'd really like the associations involved. I hope they'll come on board at some point. And they will, uh, if enough beekeepers want them to go on board, basically. And uh, certainly, uh, you imagine uh, association APRIs and so on would be prime places to put, it, put these things into practice. And <laughs> I hope that will happen a lot more in the future. Uh, most of us collect swarms. Should the queens be culled to protect the dark native bee if they are ginger? Like the culling of grey squirrels to project, protect red squirrels. Right. It's a tricky one. Uh, what I do is, I did mention briefly, I have these, that we're going to have to have improvement zones or improvement areas or, and uh, where the mating areas, where the queen mate. And what I do is I keep an area around, around where all my bees are here. Well, not all my bees are here. The bees that are here, I, I go through them in the spring and anything that doesn't fit the bill gets moved out. I don't cull it. There's nothing wrong with them. They're perfectly good honey producers. Move them out of the area. So I keep in a strain going for, the, for mating, to get the bees mated. And I get all my bees mated in this area. Um, the bees that I've moved out of the area, it's where there are lots of other sorts of bees there. And it's quite interesting because I could compare how they do with how my uh, selected bees do. And I find my selected bees do, uh, do very well. And they're, you know, gen better than the average, shall we say, which is encouraging. What I've noticed, Joe, is in the last perhaps five years, um, if a swarm comes from a wild colony, um, they're usually very good. Usually very, very good. Much better than um, swarms from uh, managed colonies. Yeah. So um, this one I think is going to be dealt with later on, but I will ask the question, how does one identify the subspecies of bee one has? Uh, very good question. Uh... In short, <laughs> um, there are systems, there are, there are complicated systems. There's uh, morphometry measurements where you can measure various veins of the wings. I'm not going to go into it now, which supposedly identifies the subspecies. There's DNA analysis, which is supposed to be more accurate. And the method I like to use is just look at the bees 
and people think well, that's a bit rough and ready but if you've got a uniform looking colony where all the workers look the same and they have dark abdomens if they've got stripes on their abdomen they're usually thin stripes not broad stripes uh, the hair around their thorax are uh, gingery yellowy brown uh, which particularly shows up in the sunshine so they can have a yellow appearance to them in the sunshine but their abdomens are dark and you gradually get a feel of what if they're yeah, anyway I, I don't want to go on too long about that but they definitely look different um, and most of course most of our colonies are a mixture and uh, certainly when I started they were all mixtures and uh, then you I what I did was pick the ones that were most most dark ones and then I developed a strain from that and it sounds rough and ready but the ones that have been DNA analysed have come back very good, very good results. Yeah. I will actually be describing the three main ones um, in uh, uh, yes. I think webinar. I think we should leave that for now. Seven right, so leave that for um, This one here, the difficulty uh, some purchase Purchasers of Queens face it, purchasers of Queen should be, uh, faces that not all sellers advertise uh, the source of their Queens. Uh, well, firstly, we're trying to encourage people to raise their own, but secondly, it is actually a very good point um, because there are a lot of Queens that are, uh, are coming in. Uh, people buy perhaps one or two Queens and then breed them up. Yeah. This is a, it's happening quite a lot. And they, they're British born, British reared, um, or Irish reared, but hopefully the Irish ones are more native than these, but um, certainly it happens in this country quite a lot. Um, and people, well, just, that's why I said we don't favour imported stock or offspring of recently imported stock. So uh, people are just going to have to ask more questions, I think. This one here you might need a little bit of help with. I have a hundred and col I have a hundred colonies that all have imported queens. What would you recommend doing? Um, nothing. Just keep going. Don't import any more queens. I, this is what I'd recommend. You might not be at all interested or uh, keen to implement my answer, but I would say <coughs> keep going. Keep selecting your best bees. Breed re your own queens and see what happens, how the population develops over, it will develop over several seasons without any influence, without more, you'll find that the native bee will start to dominate. And if you select the best ones, you'll, the best bee will start to dominate, the best. Uh, that's how I've worked and it's, I started what I've got and uh, you can gradually, the point about what my belief is, and it's controversial because it hasn't been proved by science, but the native bee, the drones and queens fly in slightly cooler conditions. Uh, they also appear to mate nearer the hive. This idea of drone congregation zones is not perhaps so necessary in warm pine weather. It's not so perhaps necessary in the native bee. And over time, the native bee dominates for those reasons. <laughs> And uh, that's my, you'll hear, it's not just me, it's it? time and time again, you hear people saying, well, I had these lovely yellow bees and they've gone black, you know, gone darker and now they're horrendous, blaming the dark bee, but of course it's because they're hybridized, uh, not because they're native bees. But that process is happening automatically. They're automatically going, tending towards the native bee. Uh, um. I'd nip in, Joe, if you don't mind, because I'm, I'm actually working on this for one of, my, one of mine. Uh, I don't think people realise that the different kinds of bees actually need different management um, uh, systems. And um, uh, it depends what uh, Queen's this particular question has got. If, let's say, they're Italians, um, they will need very different management than, let's say, the ordinary uh, mongrel or, um, or, or the, the, the native bee. Um, and of course, Italians produce huge uh, uh, colonies. And if you're used to huge colonies and you get a, a, um, uh, a decent local bee, 
um, that have got smaller colonies, uh, you'll think, crikey, there's a problem with the queen and requeen it, which I've come across on many, many occasions. So I think you need to understand what, um, uh, how, how, how the different uh, kinds of bees um, need, need, need management. But I will be covering that in my... Yeah. Perhaps um, it's a good point to say that we've had an hour and 20 minutes. We've got nine more or quite a few more lectures in the series. Uh, would it be a good time to hold fire? Or do you want to carry on, Roger? Well, on questions? Yeah. Um, well, I was just keeping Rose away from you, actually, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. I, we, 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 we'll just take one more and then we'll, okay. call, it, we'll okay. call it a go. Um, will the project be able to make beekeepers aware of other beekeepers local to them that are also part of the project? Um, well, there's probably all sorts of legislation about that, but yes, I hope we would hope that beekeepers would be able to cooperate. That would be a great thing. Um, and that would be ideal. Yeah, I'd favour that, but I don't know what the legal implications are these days. Okay, Joe, you're, you're, uh, you, you, you need a drink, no doubt. Um, <laughs> um, uh, thanks very much for uh, the talk. Um, I thought the, um, the, the questions were really good. And, yeah. um, uh, and encouraging and I hope everybody got something uh, from it. Thanks very much indeed um, for uh, setting up the program. Thanks everybody else for listening. Thank Nick Morby for hosting it and I uh, hope to see you next week. Goodbye yeah. everybody. Thank you. Thank you Joe and thanks Roger. Um, this has been recorded and the recording will be on the website within 24 hours. We've had uh, about 60 questions, so Joe hasn't been able to answer them all, but we will aim to answer them during the course of the rest of the webinars. And just on the point of uh, sharing names, those people who have joined Bibba have the option to choose to share their details, and in the future that will be made available to the members who have chosen to share. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.